Statement two of chapter two, uh, you could say elaborate on uh, statement one uh, of chapter two. Yeah. Mm. So let's see. <clears throat> so statement two says it is not possible for two conceptual thoughts to occur simultaneously uh, so here mm, although uh, it seems like yeah, Gyoba is talking about conceptual thoughts in general. <clears throat> conceptual thoughts, what are conceptual thoughts? Conceptual thoughts includes what we might call emotions. So it's not just the, the cognitive uh, uh, aspects of, of feelings and thoughts, but also the emotive. So uh, all the different types of emotions uh, most subtle and gross. You know, all those are conceptual thoughts. So you could say that what are conceptual thoughts? Conceptual thoughts in, in this more general understanding. Simply, you could say uh, it refers to anything that involves like subject, object, right? Um, subject, object is present, then that is a conceptual thought. So here, uh, it sounds as if, you know, Gyopa is just making a general statement that no two conceptual thoughts can occur simultaneously, meaning at the same time. It's all, always only one, one, one moment of mind, followed by another moment of mind, followed by another moment of mind. And so this statement uh, can be understood this way. But more importantly, uh, more to the point of uh, being the second statement in this chapter, it follows from the first statement. Uh, if you remember, uh, the first statement says, there, <clears throat> there is only virtue and non-virtue, right? and there is no neutral. Right? Yeah, so here, the second statement, when it says, uh, it is not possible for two conceptual thoughts to occur uh, at the same time. What it is saying is, then, as for virtue and non-virtue, virtuous conceptual thoughts and non-virtuous conceptual thoughts, they, they do not appear, they do not occur at the same moment. In other words, virtue and non-virtue can never be mixed together, like oil and water. It, they cannot be mixed together. And you might shake oil and water together uh, very vigorously, uh, and for a few moments, you know, uh, it might seem like uh, they, they, they are now have become one, right? but they never occur in the same place at the same time. So this, this is the, the kind of the thrust of this statement, the, the, the main point of this statement. The last statement says, there is no such thing as a neutral uh, moment of thought. The thoughts, feelings, either positive, or negative. There's only virtue and non-virtue. There's no neutral. Uh, so here, it is not possible for two conceptual thoughts to occur simultaneously at the same time. So Kembo Kunpel's commentary yeah, makes it very clear. He says, it is not possible for two conceptual thoughts of virtue and non-virtue to occur or arise simultaneously or together for one person 
in one instant. If it were possible, the faulty consequence would be two streams of consciousness and so on. Thus, they can only occur sequentially. It is said, two conceptual thoughts cannot perceive their objects simultaneously. So, the take-home lesson, again, for us is, you know, uh, sometimes we think, you know, oh, that's, that, that is a mix yeah, of both good and bad. Um, of course, you know, we, we can verbally mm, say something like that, yeah, but we got to make sure that, you know, in our level, in, in our understanding, we're not literally saying, you know, good and um, uh, uh, virtue and non-virtue can, can ever be mixed together into a third thing. They're always discrete and separate. So even in our action, you might say, oh, that, 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 that course of action, it's a mix of both good and bad. Again, as a matter of just saying, you can say that, but then if you want to really understand karmically how these things then unfold and ripen, they unfold and ripen without mixing. Uh, meaning, what is virtuous, uh, ripens as virtuous, uh, ripen as happiness. What is non-virtuous, ripens as suffering. So in other places, uh, one example given is, um, you might have a handful of seeds, uh, barley seeds, wheat seeds, right? Mm, mix all together. Superficially, you, you say that, oh, these seeds are mixed. And then you cast the seed down on the ground, you provide the right conditions, you water them, you give them enough sunlight. Huh? When they sprout, you know, they don't sprout as a third thing. They sprout accordingly. Wheat seeds give rise to wheat sprouts, barley seeds give rise to barley sprouts. Huh? They might be right next to each other but they are never confused. So here is also uh, relevant to remember this point when sometimes due to not seeing clearly, we think, oh, I've done something good and look, only this bad thing happened as a result. And then we think, you know, somehow uh, the good and the bad got mixed together and then this, this bad thing happened. Or conversely, sometimes, you know, we know we do something that we shouldn't have done and then like something good happens. And then we thought, oh, because there was a mix and this just the right mix, then good, good came, you know. <laughs> Enjoyment came, you know, but it's not like that. It's just that because it's a, a mixed bag of actions, so to say, mixed bag of actions. of actions of body, speech, and mind, it's mixed, and therefore, they ripen accordingly. There's no mixing in terms of the ripening. Then two, three, it also happens that the main mind arises from the mental factors. It also happens that the main mind arises from the mental factors. Uh, so here, um, we are introduced to some uh, more uh, detailed uh, use of vocabulary. Um, so in the Buddha's teachings, uh, he speaks of there are main mind, uh, like basic mental qualities, and then these mental qualities give rise to secondary uh, mental qualities called mental factors. So that's the meaning of main mind and mental factors. So in a way you could say this is kind of um, Buddhist psychology. 
So here and there, Buddha talked about this. Oh, this is a, a basic quality found in the minds. Now we're talking about just the ordinary functioning of the mind. Now we're not talking about nature of mind, you know, and things like that. And the the kind of relative level of the functioning of of the of the mind. Uh, you know, here and there, Buddha would say, oh, this is a basic uh, property of mind. And over here, these are secondary qualities, secondary emotions that the mind is capable of producing. Those are called mental factors. Yeah. So normally, uh, mental factors arises from uh, the more basic ones, uh, the main minds. But here, Kyopa apparently said, it also happens that the main mind, uh, a main mind, a basic uh, quality of mind, can arise due to mental factors giving rise to them. So this is kind of counter the, ba the, the, the more basic understanding, which is, it's the main minds that give rise to the secondary, the mental factors. Here it says, it could also be that sometimes the secondary factors of mind give rise to the primary factor of mind. Give rise as in, you know, um, instigate the arising. <clears throat> so let's look at 2.3, Kempo Kunpel's commentary on page 126, if you have the physical book. Furthermore, although it is generally the case that mental factors arise from the main mind, it also happens that the main mind arises from the mental factors. From the mind itself, which is clear light and free from elaboration, the self-appearing objects and the self-eliminating subject arise. And these are the mental factors. From these again, uh, from these again, the main mind arises. So here in Kempo Kumpel's uh, commentary, he does introduce uh, an, an even more basic quality of mind, uh, which is the mind itself. And here now we're talking, we are talking about like nature of mind, the mind itself. So here it says, which is clear light, which is luminous, and free from elaboration. Free from elaboration is the emptiness aspect, and clear light is the knowing aspect. Always, eh, we say these two basic qualities of mind in terms of nature of mind. Eh, it is empty, and yet it knows. So it says, from this mind itself arises, eh, objects and subjects. These objects and subjects, he says, these are the secondary mind, mental factors. The basic mind then is the mind itself. And he says, from these again, from these subjects and objects that arise as mental factors, again, the main mind arises. Footnote. In the footnote, the translator says, in this Vajra statement, the main mind and the mental factors should not be understood as the general Abhidharma classifications of the 51 mental factors. So here, Kempo Kumpel actually takes this, you know, in a different direction. Yeah, in the more general uh, explanation, there's no talk about like nature of mind, nature of mind is free from elaboration. They are talking about what I was talking about, uh, more about this, this, this ordinary functioning of the mind. Uh, and that's the Abhidharma system, uh, analyzing uh, them into 51 mental factors. The main mind, which is here explained as uh, non-dual wisdom, uh, or this nature of mind itself, can arise from the confusion of duality of subjects and objects. 
which is here called mental factors. When one, for example, receives instructions on the nature of mind and realizes the confusion versus the ultimate nature of this non-dual mind. Yeah, so what's going on here is, uh, Kenbu Kunpel is explaining uh, that Kyopa here is using main mind and mental factors in a way that is different from different from the way uh, the system of explaining the, uh, the ordinary functioning of the mind. Here, main mind is redefined as the basic nature of mind. Mental factors are that which is projected out. So here when it says uh, that mental factors can give rise to main mind, it's saying confusion because mental factors, uh, by this definition, right, mental factors are all uh, colored by confusion. So here it's saying mental factors, these confused states of mind can have the potential to be used uh, to point students to seeing the main mind, which is nature of mind. So that uh, in that sense, you know, the afflictive emotions are these mental factors. And even though, uh, generally speaking, uh, the afflictive emotions have no uh, virtue to them at all, no good to them at all, but they can be used to lead us into understanding the nature of mind, which in, in this context of this statement is called the main mind. So for example, he says, the first moment when one is thinking, I will do this, is the main mind. Thinking about the methods for accomplishing it, the mental factors, and the moment of thinking I've accomplished it, again, the main mind. In this way, they take turns circulating and arising. The Buddha also taught in the scriptures that karmic formation arises due to ignorance and consciousness arises due to karmic formation. So they are causal conditions for each other. This also proves this Vajra statement. Uh, so interestingly, here, uh, Gimbo Gumbel reverts back to uh, the more usual way of talking about mind and mental factors. <laughs> and so he's showing how uh, this particular Vajra statement that can be understood in both uh, the more usual way uh, of mind and mental factors being the functioning of the ordinary confused mind. Uh, so then the examples of that is the main mind is, I will do this. Then thinking about all the methods for accomplishing it, uh, thinking of all the problems that could arise and what you need to do to, to counteract it, right? Mm, all those are mental factors. Then you complete, uh, you, you, you think through all of that. Now, now you do it and then you say, oh, I've accomplished it. And that is again back to a main mind, according to uh, the example he uses here. So what he points out here, Kenbu Kunpel, is that this statement can be understood on two levels. And for our purposes, I will say the first level he mentions uh, is the one most relevant. And because the second one is more about like Abhidharma psychology. Uh, and since, you know, neither I, probably you, uh, are that much of an expert on Abhidharma psychology and studying all these different categories and divisions and subdivisions, you know, uh, the second point uh, uh, here, starting from, for example, the first moment when one is thinking, you know, there, you know, we're like, eh, I don't know. 
you know, if that's very meaningful to me. But the first one is definitely meaningful, which is that mental factors here defined as the uh, projection of subject and object out of that which is fundamentally without essence and unelaborated, but clear light, luminous, so what arises from there is the projection of subject and object. So that's the mental factor. Even those uh, kind of what give what give what gives rise to delusion can be used to point us back to uh, recognizing main mind, basic mind. Uh, and this is the mind itself. So this is statement three of chapter two. <laughs> statement four. Uh, we won't start today because it's it's a very interesting one. We might need more time. I don't want to rush. And this is the one that says, you know, uh, other people say and the body is what, uh, other people say the mind is what goes from lifetime to lifetime, uh, transmigrate, uh, that wonders. Uh, here, uh, Kyoba says, uh, here I say is the body that wonders. <laughs> uh, just a hint, 2-4 uh, uh, mm, is sort of in the same style as 2-3. Statement three, as in Kyopa is redefining some terms. And in both cases of redefining terms, I can almost imagine that um, how these statements were made is in the context of Kyopa Rinpoche finding uh, the monks who are training with him, getting carried away in debating kind of, you could say, philosophical or academic points. Mm, so like, is this a mind or is this a mental factor? And minds, uh, you know, by definition, you know, mental factors come from mind and not the other way around. And, you know, they get very animated, right? Debating this. Uh, or, or then they even might get very animated, right? Debating, you know, can two minds, you know, can exist in the same place in the same time, at the same time for the same person? Yes, you can. Yes, you cannot. This and that. And then Kyopa will say something very kind of like, you know, out there, so to say. You know, when he says, no, they cannot. And, you know, that kind of stops, right? The... The, the the kind of intellectual debate, you know. And then he says, you know, the main point of that is about virtue and non-virtue. Then likewise, this mind and mental factor, what gives rise to what and what has capacity to give rise to, which of this has capacity to give rise to which, and which of this have no capacity to give rise to this, which, you know, they, they debate so much, right? Argue so much that Kyopa stops it and say, actually, it can't. Then they say, what do you mean? He says, now I'm not talking about what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about what's more important. So likewise, that next statement that we're going to look at, you know, uh, is the mind wonders, uh, the mind wonders this way, as wonder in the sense now of from lifetime to lifetime. Uh, oh, the mind wandered this way, the mind wandered that way, this way, that way, that way, this way. Uh, then, of course, you know, for many of us, even you're like, what? If there's no soul, you know, then what's wandering and this and that, that, right? Kyopa suddenly imagine the teacher coming in the room and we, we get very animated with this uh, discussion, argument, debate. And he says, Actually, it's not the mind that wonders, it's the body that wonders. What? And imagine like he, he walks out, he leaves, you know. <laughs> yeah, so maybe they were like gathered at some dining hall, you know. Then he walks in to get water or whatever, and then he hears this, he says, Ah, 
not, not mind that wonders, it's the body that wonders. And he walks off. And of course, he has, what? A very similar story. I think this statement about is the body that wonders and not the mind. Mm -hmm. uh, a very similar uh, statement. Uh, this is uh, in the biography of the person called the sixth patriarch of the Zen tradition, a Chinese Buddhist monk lived in the seventh century uh, Huineng. So in one part in his biography, now he's already a famous teacher. Many students are gathered around him. It said that one day he chanced upon the students, uh, two students, looking at a flagpole. And on the flagpole, there is a flag fluttering in the air. And so they were debating. One, one monk says, huh? it's the flag that is moving. And the other monk said, no, no, it's the wind that is moving. <laughs> so, is it the flag? Is it the wind? Is it the flag? Well, no, 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 it cannot be the flag because the flag by itself cannot move. You know, it's the wind. No, it cannot be the wind. You know, uh, if there's wind, no flag, there's no flag moving. Argue, argue, argue. Uh, Six Patriot overhears and he, he, he gives his statement. He says, neither wind nor flag, but the mind. The mind is moving. <laughs> and he walks off. And I'm like, what? <laughs> See, right? He's not, he's saying, it's not. Right? Why are you debating on whether it's, you know, are you, in the, are you now physics students? <laughs> what are you here to do? Huh? Become experts in physics and, 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 you know, the mechanics of that? No. What's really moving here is your mind, right? <laughs> so now in Gilbert's scenario, yeah, they're not debating physics, they are debating psychology. Uh, main mind, secondary mind, there's that, there's that, there's that. Then Kyopo comes in and say, not the mind that wanders, that moves. It's the body that wanders and moves. What? <laughs> so we'll see. Tomorrow, uh, how the body is the, that which wanders. <laughs>